that's not Fumitan anymore. Oh my fuck. When Mika said those words and picked up Cordelia, just seeing the anguish, her, she couldn't even believe that Fumitan was dead, dude. Ah, those words, man, it was so cold but real. And that's the thing, this episode got me because I knew this was gonna happen. Iron Blooded Orphans being on that UC timeline level, the closest thing to that in a long while, one of the realest Gundam series since Double Zero and the True Savior. And on top of that, you know, this being Okada and Tatsuyuki. I knew what was coming, and there's still more tragedy to come in this series. That's for damn sure. But Fumidon, dude. Dying, saving Cordelia, getting her redemption, and at the same time, the feels closing out her character so well, especially with these final flashbacks, which felt kind of forced, but ultimately definitely rounded out and solidified the feels and the dynamic between them, why Fumitan made the choices that she did, and how she ultimately came to, you know, sacrifice herself for Cordelia and love her regardless of the, the hatred that she bared inside for so long. <sighs> Iron-Blooded Orphans, episode 16. Before I even get into the episode, though, let me just give me a second to, to, to fanboy right now, because it has not been officially confirmed, but what have I been saying since day one? In my episode one review of Iron-Blooded Orphans, I've been saying, for this to truly be the savior of Gundam and how I see it panning out, we will get that second 25 episode season. And last night, there is news and talk of the soundtrack for I Am Blooded Orphans this this run, this season, being listed as season one. There's no, been no official confirmation from Sunrise as to whether we're gonna get a season two or not, but this series, being the savior of Gundam for this this generation, for this decade, aside, you know, not counting the, the OVAs like Thunderbolt, Unicorn, and the Origins OVAs, this right here is going for the, the going the distance, is going to that 50 episode length, and shit's gonna get real, I'm telling you, the last portion of this season Shit's gonna go down. We may very well be parting with numerous Tekkenon members. There's death flags everywhere. Dude. On my boy Naze, there's been death flags on Orga from the beginning. Kudelia has death flags on her. It's fucking crazy. It's fucking crazy. So all I need to do is continue to steal my resolve and approach this series like I would anything else in, a, in the UC timeline, even though it's not. Even though this is, you know, Calamity or whatever it's called, I, I, I still have to approach it as if it was a UC timeline series. So, I digress. Let's dive in to this episode, man, and the massacre of the people from the slums, you know, trying to incite change on door three, and finding out that everything went basically according to the Fee Noblesse's plan, you know, the, finding out that he had this whole thing instigated and planned throughout the Dork colonies, and this was to look as though it was a broad-scale revolution with Kudelia at its center. And it was so fucking sad, dude, and twisted at the same time. And uh, I have to, to applaud Okada, because the writing and, you know, Tatsuki as well, the, the direction and everything just has been absolutely amazing. But... Seeing that woman that was part of, you know, the whole riot die in Cudelia's arms, and she's like, it's almost like a fairy tale. Playing off of the whole kind of fantastical orchestration that Noblesse was trying to carry out and position Cudelia in this way for his own endgame, which still remains to be completely revealed. I need to talk about that in a second. But seeing that that transpire, I was just like, damn. This shit is real, and all the while, you know, the, the spear in Kudelia's eyes never really truly broken, still trying to find, you know, the best possibilities to save people, and still shining, as Fumitan said. And Kudelia's character definitely has a ways to go in, in terms of development, and this is where I think the real push for that comes, because, like I've said from the beginning, as far as Kudelia goes, as a, as a you know, gum heroine archetype, we're still on the levels of that kind kind of Relina meets Marina with a dash of Lacus, and yeah, for me, those are not times. I mean, I, 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 unlike a lot of people, I don't dislike Relina, nor do I dislike Lacus. Marina's a pretty solid heroine, but they're some of the weakest heroines in, in, in the Gunners. I mean, Lacus, arguably, you could see her stronger, and the same with Relina, but still, 
So that's the kind of vibe that I get from, from, you know, Cordelia, that I've always gotten from her. But for her to start to grow at this point and reach those levels that uh, of some of my favorites, like Sayla, in terms of the archetype that she's slotted into, because there are, you know, females in Gundam that are not main heroines that are fucking amazing. But she can reach those Sayla, like, maybe like Kiel levels and everything like that. You know, I, I guess I wouldn't really count Lala from, from that perspective, but my girl Lala, Karn, something like of, of that level then she can truly start to shine and i very well see that happening during the second portion of this series granted it depends on what transpires with the tech on how you know strong her resolve is and how she's able to move forward after losing fumitan but we'll, we'll see how that goes meanwhile gallahorn man gallahorn is too fucking fiendish i'm sorry it, it, it's insane that they were able and i don't know how deep this goes, I don't know, like I said, Noblesse's full endgame, what his, how much power he actually has if he does in fact control Galahorn from the shadows, because there's no apparent link between them, they're separate, just like, you know, Teowas is a separate entity, Noblesse's, you know, whole conglomerate is its own separate entity and everything like that, but he may have, for example, like, um, you know, McGillis's father and everything like that, he may have ties to him and the seven supernovas and everything like that, or even be a part of it himself. Because the way that Galahorn was so eager to shape this as a rebellion and call it was insane. Even going as far as to, you know, ensnare the entirety of, of the, the, the protest in, you know, setting up this false bomb and forcing, you know, this panic to where they started shooting and firing off and giving them the, the excuse they needed to murder them in cold blood. Just absolutely slaughter them. It's getting dark. Like I said, it's getting real on that. You see timeline level X, you know, being Okada and Tatsuki, it's, it's real. But that shit, dude, the massacre, I was just like, damn, dude, the chaos in this episode was real. We saw it culminating to this point, and the feels and everything co coming to fruition that's been built up in the last few episodes, you know, with Biscuit's older brother and seeing his breakdown after Navona's death and everything like that. It was, it was real. It was, it was very visceral, and it hit me with the feels, you know, Fumitan's death, man. I, I, she was my sexy goddess. I don't know who I'm gonna fall back on now, to be completely honest, for sexy goddess in the series. I mean, I guess I could go with one of Naze's girls, or I guess I could go with, you know, Mary Bit, but... Fumitan, man, god damn. I, I honestly love Fumitan, just the struggle in her character, seeing her make the right choice in the end and sacrifice her life for Cordelia and showcasing that she truly cared about her was amazing. You know, you get those final bits of backstory as to why she hated the kind of naive and innocent yet, you know, strong look in, in Cordelia's eyes and this kind of... Why she hated the, you know, ignorant yet honest look in Cordelia's eyes and, you know, that scene in the childhood and Fumitan's origins and everything like that being coming from poverty, which is a lot of things that we could have assumed about her character and that we did really get through subtext, but just seeing it confirmed and seeing the flashback definitely rounded everything out as far as her character goes. The whole thing with the book, you know, the uh, that... that you know, Cordelia gave her in the past the history of revolutions and her kind of seeing, you know, Cordelia and whoever that character was in that in that story, um, whatever historical character it may be, which I, I've, I've seen and heard a lot of theories as to people, you know, talking about that, which also adds, you know, death flags to Cordelia's character. But that aside... They could have definitely introduced that earlier, and it would have probably flowed better, and, I, and that, I think that's one problem that I have with the kind of exposition we got into it, but ultimately it was real, and it definitely did round our character as well. The symbolism with the, you know, the whole pendant that she gave her, and, and Cordelia's tears at the end, I was like, damn, I was like, Mika, man. And granted, you know, my boy Mika has to keep it moving. They had to go, he had to get her to, to face the stark reality quickly and move on, but those are, that's not Fumitan anymore the little scene between Mika and Atra because after last episode seeing you know Atra that definitely has a new level of respect as far as I'm concerned and I could get behind you know the pairing of, of Mika and Atra although it's definitely going to be Mika x Kudu. That that's just the OTB man. that's how it needs to go for me that's always been the OTB from the jump but I wouldn't be salty if Atra and Mika ended up together and that little endearing moment between them where he's like are you sure you'll be okay uh finally at the end of this episode with Makmurudo 
contacting noblesse and you know that's just how shrewd this man is to have uncovered the entirety of noblesse's plan at the same time seeing the shade within where he's just like we can use this don't worry if cordelia survives we can work together and we can both turn an incredible profit off of this i was like god damn i knew i couldn't trust this bastard this godfather of tewas and the, at the at the same time, these strengthen the death lags because of of Mahmura's involvement uh, against my boy Naze and Orga and everything like that, and then, you know various members of their crew and Tekadon as a whole. So, going into the final portions of this first season, I will refer to it as the first season because I wholeheartedly believe we'll be getting that second season. But shit is about to go in. We see from the preview, you know, as a result of Galahorn going in to to quell this kind of rebellion and everything like that, we're going to be getting some heavy Molosu battles. You know, Mika's going to be going in. There's going to be another confrontation with Gaile with McGillis with in his, in his new fiendish mass form I, I I still don't know what his play is with that and still you know feeling the death lags on Almeria it could even be on Guy Leo as far as you know hearkening back to that OG Mobile Gundam and the things that I've been pointing out with that various tropes and connections between the series and everything like that who knows where where it could go as far as that's concerned but i expect myself to have to to come to terms this is, this is only the beginning the fumitan feels and losing her in this episode is only the beginning of what i feel is going to start to happen with this series and what we need to prepare ourselves for so that's pretty much it man let me know how you felt about this episode of iron blooded orphans it went in i mean the anim the, the animation an art style definitely at some points in the episode especially during you know the whole riot and everything like that were kind of meh but ultimately in the scenes where it counted like Sfumitan's sacrifice you know the direction the cinematography was amazing and plus they gotta maintain budget and they gotta they gotta go in where you know it is really necessary in the bigger scenes in the in the mo mobile suit battles and everything like that so I'll see you can excuse you know minor little errors and, and you know less attention to detail in big you know broad scope scenes like with the, the march and everything like that on you know the capital door three so Overall, episode was beast as always. Let me know your thoughts. Get hyped for that second season because it's definitely going to be reality. And as far as I'm concerned, and that's pretty much it. I'm out. Peace.